It was in the early years of the 14th century that the two pseudo-sciences of alchemy and astrology, the sisters of chemistry and astronomy, made their way into England. At first, their progress was by no means so rapid as it had been on the continent, for in England as yet, there was no educated class prepared to give their leisure to the work of experimental investigation. A solitary scholar here and there lighted his torch at the altar fire, which the continental philosophers kept burning with so much diligence and curiosity, and was generally rewarded for his heterodox enthusiasm by the persecution of the church and the prejudice of the vulgar. But by degrees the new sciences increased the number of their adherents, and the more active intellects of the time embraced the theory of astral influences and were fascinated by the delusion of the philosopher's stone. Many a secret furnace blazed day and night with the charmed flames which were to resolve the metals into their original elements and place the pale student in possession of the coveted magisterium, or universal medicine. At length, the alchemists became a sufficiently numerous and important body to draw the attention of the government, which regarded their proceedings with suspicion from a fear that the result might injuriously affect the coinage. In 1434, the legislature enacted that the making of gold or silver should be treated as a felony. But the parliament was influenced by a very different motive from that of the king and his council, its patriotic fears being awakened lest the executive, enabled by the new science to increase without limit the pecuniary resources of the crown, should be rendered independent of parliamentary control. In 1455, Henry VI, issued four patents in succession to certain knights, London citizens, chemists, monks, mass priests, and others, granting them leave and license to undertake the discovery of the Philosopher's Stone to the great benefit of the realm and the enabling the king to pay all the debts of the crown in real gold and silver. On the remarkable fact that these patents were issued to ecclesiastics as well as laymen, Prynne afterwards remarked with true theological accredity, that they were so included because they were such good artists in transubstantiating bread and wine in the Eucharist, and were therefore the more likely to be able to effect the transmutation of base metals into better. Nothing came of the patents. The practical common sense of Englishmen never took very kindly to the alchemical delusion, and Chaucer very faithfully describes the contempt with which it was generally regarded. Enthusiasts there were, no doubt, who firmly believed in it, and knaves who made a profit out of it, and dupes who were preyed upon by the knaves, and so it languished on through the 16th and 17th centuries. It seems at one time to have amused the shrewd intellect of Queen Elizabeth, and at another to have caught the volatile fancy of the Duke of Buckingham. But alchemy was in the main the modus vivendi of quacks and cheats, of such impostors as Ben Jonson has drawn so powerfully in his great comedy, a subtle, a face, and a doll common, who, in the Sir Epicure Mammons of the time, found their appropriate victims. These creatures played on the greed and credulity of their dupes with successful audacity, and excited their imaginations by extravagant promises. The English alchemists, however, with a few exceptions, depended for a livelihood chiefly on their sale of magic charms, love filters, and even more dangerous potions and on horoscope casting and fortune-telling by the hand or by cards. They acted also as agents in many a dark intrigue and unlawful project, being generally at the disposal of the highest bidder and seldom shrinking from any crime. The earliest name of note on the role of the English magicians, necromancers and alchemists is that of Roger Bacon. This great man has some claim to be considered the father of experimental philosophy, since it was he who first laid down the principles upon which physical investigation should be conducted. Speaking of science, he says, in language far in advance of his times, There are two modes of knowing, by argument and by experiment. Argument winds up a question, but does not lead us to acquiesce in, or feel certain of, the contemplation of truth, unless the truth be proved and confirmed by experience. To experimental science, he ascribed three differentiating characters. First, she tests by experiment the grand conclusions of all other sciences. Next, she discovers, with reference to the ideas connected with other sciences, splendid truths, to which these sciences without assistance are unable to attain. Her third prerogative is that, unaided by the other sciences and of herself, 
she can investigate the secrets of nature. These truths, now accepted as trite and self-evident, ranked in Roger Bacon's day as novel and important discoveries. He was born at Ilchester in Somersetshire in 1214. Of his lineage, parentage and early education, we know nothing, except that he must have been very young when he went to Oxford, for he took orders there before he was 20. Joining the Franciscan Brotherhood, he applied himself to the study of Greek, Latin, Hebrew and Arabic, but his genius chiefly inclined towards the pursuit of the natural sciences, in which he obtained such a mastery that his contemporaries accorded to him the flattering title of the Admirable Doctor. His lectures gathered round him a crowd of admiring disciples until the boldness of their speculations aroused the suspicion of the ecclesiastical authorities and in 1257 they were prohibited by the general of his order. Then Pope Innocent Alpha interfered, interdicting him from the publication of his writings and placing him under close supervision. He remained in this state of tutelage until Clement IV, a man of more liberal views, assumed the triple tiara, who not only released him from his irksome restraints, but desired him to compose a treatise on the sciences. This was the origin of Bacon's Opus Majus, Opus Minus and Opus Tertius, which he completed in a year and a half and dispatched to Rome. In 1267, he was allowed to return to Oxford, where he wrote his Compendium Studii Philosophia, his vigorous advocacy of new methods of scientific investigation, or perhaps his unsparing exposure of the ignorance and vices of the monks and the clergy, again brought down upon him the heavy arm of the ecclesiastical tyranny. His works were condemned by the general of his order, and in 1278 he was thrown into prison, where he was detained for several years. It is said that he was not released until 1292, the year in which he published his latest production, the Compendium Studii Theologiae. Two years afterwards, he died. In many respects, Bacon was greatly in advance of his contemporaries, but his general repute ignores his real and important services to philosophy and builds up a glittering fabric upon mechanical discoveries and inventions to which it is to be feared he cannot lay claim. As Professor Adamson puts it, he certainly describes a method of constructing a telescope, but not so as to justify the conclusion that he himself was in possession of that instrument. The invention of gunpowder has been attributed to him on the strength of a passage in one of his works, which, if fairly interpreted, disposes at once of the pretension. Besides, it was already known to the Arabs. Burning glasses were in common use, and there is no proof that he made spectacles although he was probably acquainted with the principle of their construction. It is not to be denied, however, that in his interesting treatise on the secrets of nature and art, he exhibits every sign of a far-seeing and lively intelligence and foreshadows the possibility of some of our great modern inventions. But, like so many masterminds of the Middle Ages, he was unable wholly to resist the fascinations of alchemy and astrology. He believed that various parts of the human body were influenced by the stars and that the mind was thus stimulated to particular acts without any relaxation or interruption of free will. His mirror of alchemy absolutely bristles with crude and unfounded theories as for instance that nature in the formation of metallic veins tends constantly to the production of gold but is impeded by various accidents and in this way creates metals in which impurities mingle with the fundamental substances. The main elements, he says, are quicksilver and sulfur, and from these all metals and minerals are compounded. Gold he describes as a perfect metal, produced from a pure, fixed, clear and red quicksilver, and from a sulfur also pure, fixed and red, not incandescent and unalloyed. Iron is unclean and imperfect, because engendered of a quicksilver which is impure, too much congealed, earthy, incandescent, white and red, and of a similar variety of sulphur. The stone, or substance, by which the transmutation of the imperfect into the perfect metals was to be effected must be made in the main, he said, of sulphur and mercury. It is not easy to determine how soon an atmosphere of legend gathered around the figure of the admirable doctor, but undoubtedly it originated quite as much in his astrological errors as in his scientific experiments. Some of the myths of which he is the traditional hero belong to a very much earlier period, as, for instance, that of his brazen head, which appears in the old romance of Valentine and Orson, 
as well as in the history of Albertus Magnus, everyone is filled with the story of Friar Bacon that made a bronze head to speak these words, time is. Which, though there went not the like relations, is surely too literally received and was but a mystical fable concerning the philosopher's great work 